Hello and welcome to the next uh, crash course in curvilinear and interaction. This is a condensed um, lecture going through the steps required in linear regression involving curvilinear relationships and an interaction relationship. Um, first of all, we'll start with curvilinear, predominantly quadratic and cubic, and go through what this means. Um, looking at the relationship of um, two variables, in this case neuroticism and anxiety, at first it appears a straight line might be adequate to summarize this relationship, but there's a possibility that this line may also be um, curved. Looking at what what could contribute to this, this could be what is known as a quadratic relationship. That is, um, a, as it as neuroticism increases, anxiety increases an accelerating rate. However, looking at just the linear relationship, it is significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.05, and it accounts for 83.4% um, of the variance. Looking at the assumptions of just performing a linear regression, however, there appears to be some fanning from left to right. This indicates that the, there may be a violation of the assumption of constant variance and linearity that we need to um, rectify. So linear, quadratic, and cubic trends look like this. Um, linear has no bumps, quadratic has got one inflection, cubic has got two. Could be argued that neuroticism in this case has got one trend, or one bump rather, making it quadratic. Alternatively, you could see it as two. We will test whether either and or are significant. So to create the values to, te to get SPSS to test for a quadratic and cubic trend, um, the format of the line is going to take um, this, where you'll see that um, you see for the cubic trend, um, this is the model that we're testing, so we're going to have four, four betas, three of which are gradients, and you'll notice that the values of x are just simply x squared, um, and x to the power of 3. So it follows that to compute iv2 or x squared we just take um, each level of the iv and we square it and to compute the x but, uh, x3 we just cube all of the iv. Execute that. So in our data sheet the first score might look like this. Someone with anxiety of 32 will have neuroticism to 12 um, and if that's squared that's 144 or 12 cubed is 1728. So let's go through what fitting um, the two models would look like. So we analyze regression linear and we fit it with three independent variables of the three terms. We could also fit it um, again just with only the neuroticism squared term and for comparison there is the linear model without either. So the first one is, includes the cubic and quadratic, the second one includes just the cubic, the third one is the linear. Um, we always have to test the lower level of trends in the model, i.e. we couldn't just put neuroticism cubed in a model. Um, we need all of them. We use the highest level of trend that's significant, so if we work our way down the page looking at the p-values, we'd see that we'd probably end up with the neuroticism cubed model. We reduce the model until the highest level is significant, and always interpret the highest level first. So if we're sticking with neuroticism squared, um, and neuroticism was still the linear trend was still also significant. We interpret the highest level, that is neuroticism squared, over and above the linear trend. So in this case, we're going to stick with neuroticism squared. That's our linear regression equation, um, and all the other same rules follow. You can predict points using this equation. Um, when we're explaining it to other people, instead of just saying as neuroticism varies, anxiety increases or decreases, we say as neuroticism varies, anxiety increases or decreasing at an increasing or decreasing rate. So that's our ideal model. Let's go through assessing the assumptions. Um, you can see that on the left there you have the original assumptions which have got this fanning. Um, on the right you've got uh, less of this going on. So on the right is the qu a quadratic model which has removed some of this violation of this assumption. On the left was the original linear model which the, that line indicates the fanning. Moving on to interaction testing. Um, interactions um, occur between two variables. Let's just have a look at what a mean table looks like for creating interactions. So in this case life expectancy is our DV, gross national product is our first IV and infant death rate is our second IV. So gross national product 
has been centred, infant death rate has also been centred. Just ignore gross national product and infant death rate for a minute. Moving on beyond that, so looking at the interaction of DV, of life expectancy, it's severely left skewed, doesn't appear to actually have a central tendency, um, but this is not unexpected. We might want to change this data, but we'll leave it as is because this is what we expect for this variable. These are our two IVs that we're going to include in our interaction, infant death rate and gross national product. Again, they're right skewed. This is not unusual. You have a lot of countries who are not earning very much money and disproportionate countries that have got more. Um, and likewise with the infant death rate, you have a large group of countries with a very high infant death rate. Um, sorry, very low death rate, infant death rate, and then the rest have got um, spread out of a range of it. So there's two models that we're going to fit. The first one's going to be the additive model and the second one's going to be the interaction model. The additive model only has the main effects. That'll be IV1, IV2. The interaction model will have the main effects IV1, IV2 and the interactions, in this case the interaction term. To compute the interaction term we're going to multiply each of the um, levels of IV1 with each of the levels of IV2 to create a third variable. That is the SPSS syntax above. Um, in this case for person, a country that had GNP um, of 5 and infant death rate of 4, their new interaction term would be 20. We then run the bivariate variables as per usual. We inspect whether the IVs significantly predict the DVs. They do in this case. There are some um, incredibly strange relationships, but that's not to be expected. We would comment on them the normal way. Likewise, we would comment on these bivariate statistics the same as in multiple linear regression. The linear regression table output will come slightly differently. Model 1 refers to the additive model, Model 2 refers to the interaction model. As you can see there is a negligible gain from Model 1 to Model 2 in R squared. It is just an increase of 0.4%. Um, this is the coefficients table, Model 1 being the uh, additive model, Model 2 being the interaction model. So as I said before the interaction term provided negligible increase in explanatory power, so model 1 being the additive model, model 2 being the interaction model. Both models, however, are significant. If you have a look, they've both got a p-value of less than 0 0.05. We can conduct, we can calculate the conditional st standard deviation for either model because we may need this later. The coefficients table, so this is the table for both models. Let's just have a look at the interaction one at first and let's just assume that it is significant. Um, going through the new format of the line, we have an additional beta with the interaction term and it looks like this. We can still calculate um, predicted points using this format. The key difference would be that end component, the interaction term, when we're substituting in the value of gross national product and infant death, we put in 10 and minus 5 into that and multiply it by the gradient of our interaction term. Moving on to what else we can do with this, we can also do things like um, look at the relationship of gross national product for a country with infant death equal to 10. So this is holding infant death equals um, 10 at a constant, then looking at the relationship between gross national product and life expectancy. And we end up with the formula over there. So gross national product equals 49.712 plus something times gross, uh, plus 0 0.632 times gross national product. Other comments on the models, we can still say the same about the additive model and the interaction model. We can comment on the gradient of both. We can comment on the um, on the y-intercept in exactly the same way. A couple of interaction rules always fit the main effects with the interaction effect. If the interaction effect is significant, you interpret it above and beyond the main effects, and if it's not significant, you revert to the additive model. In this case, we found our interaction term was not significant, so we should really revert to the additive model. But I'm going to go through the assumptions now of the interaction model. We assess the assumption of normality the same way with the residuals, um, with the normality of the residuals and a Shapiro Wilk test. We can look at the constant variance and linearity assumption using a scatter plot. We can also plot individual variables against each of the, um, each of the residuals and come up with the following plots. 
Finally, we have a new statistic that I wanted to introduce today. It's the partial correlation statistic. The partial correlation statistic tells you the amount of variance or solving and other, other variables constant. It's generated by asking for the partial correlations when, um, or the part correlations rather, when you are um, generating them in SPSS. You square the part correlations um, and then that gives you what percentage of the variance whilst holding the other variable constant is attributed to by that variable. So that concludes the lecture today. Uh, thank you very much. Stay tuned to the website for more lectures down the track.